Good evening, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. So it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker tonight, Mr. Ilya Panamarev. Ilya's career spans 20 years of experience in politics, international operation, investment, and entrepreneurship. His primary work has focused on IT and energy. Currently, Ilya is an opposition member at Duma, the Russian parliament. Uh, he is a social democrat representing Siberia. And he's chairing, in that role, he's chairing innovations and venture capital subcommittees of Duma. He has played a key role in the protests of 2012. He was the only member of the parliament in Duma to vote against annexation of Crimea. Ilya serves as the advisor uh, on the international business development, commercialization, and technology transfer for the president of the Skolkova Foundation. You may have heard about Skolkova Foundation, also known as the spinal cord of the Russian innovation ecosystem. Um, Skolkova is the managing company of the project, which is currently chaired by former President Medvedev. Before being elected to, the, to Duma in 2007, uh, Mr. Ponomarev was working for the Secretary of IT and Telecom as National Coordinator for High Tech Parks Task Force, which was a $6 billion private-public partnership uh, project to develop a network of uh, small settlements across the country for fostering innovation and R&D activities. Ilya has also served in the private sector. For example, just as a couple of examples, served as vice president of Yukus Oil Company, which is the largest Russian oil and gas corporation. And he has also served as director of CIS Business Development and Marketing for Schlumberger Oil Field Services. He is a member of Society of Petroleum Engineers, Council for Foreign and Defense Policies, Council for National Strategy strategy and a fellow at the Open Russia Foundation. Ilya is a member of Global Science and Innovation Council, which is chaired by Prime Minister Najib of Malaysia. Uh, Ilya is an author of numerous research articles and magazine articles about new economy, regional policies, education, and international relations. He holds a BS degree in physics from Moscow State University and a Master of Public Administration from Russian State Social University. Please join me in welcoming Elia Ponomarev. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Jelly. I started to get worried that we need to wrap up right after my bio, <laughs> but I think it looks like it's not the case still. Uh, today is a great day for me, and not just because I'm here at Commonwealth Club, and I'm very much thankful for having me here, but also because I see my lovely wife, Katya, whom I haven't seen from August, because from August I am stuck here in the United States without being able to return uh, to Russia, and actually we missed uh, our 20th anniversary uh, in December, so we're going to celebrate it tonight. And uh, uh. So from those pleasant things, let's talk about a little bit lesser pleasant, about Russia. Uh, 
you know, I have very deep and mixed emotions right now about my country. From one hand, I am very glad that we are once again in the spotlight of world media and global attention. We are talking here about what's going on in Russia. Because I remember just, uh, what it was, five years ago, I was organizing a trip of President Medvedev at the time here in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco. And uh, we were meeting at the time with Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg and uh, with Governor Schwarzenegger. And you know what, to gather an audience to meet President Medvedev, it was pretty challenging task. Uh, now you're all here, <laughs> but the reason for that is by far not as pleasant as that visit of President Medvedev. Now is no longer President Medvedev, it's now Mr. Putin again in power. He says it's like his first term, you can believe it. Uh, and that means that legally he can stay in power for another at least eight years then find another placeholder for a while, and then continue. And of course, that's not something that I want for my country. And when I talk to my friends here in America, everybody asks, so who is Mr. Putin? That was the question that was asked by one journalist. Actually, it was an American journalist from Philadelphia newspaper. It was asked when uh, Mr. Putin was just named as successor for Mr. Yeltsin in uh, 1999. And it was Davos Political Forum. And it was already obvious that it would be Putin who would be the next president. And still nobody knew who is Mr. Putin. People in the audience at that time, they were laughing, but they couldn't answer this question. And we went on this blind date with our future president. And we elected him just because he was named by Yeltsin. And just because he seemed capable, because he uh, promised stability for the country. And he promised uh, to stop terrorist attacks on Russian cities, which happened in uh, 1999 which right now we have a lot of ground to believe that they happened with the active participation of Russian security forces, actually. And that's what we see uh, right now. We saw first years of very active neoliberal reforms, which were very much praised by uh, people like Boris Nemtsov, who was just assassinated last week in Moscow. Because they said, okay, so maybe the guy is a Pinochet, but he is doing something right for the economy. And they supported him genuinely. But after that, when uh, Mr. Putin sent to jail the most successful and the most high profile and the most transparent business person in Russia, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was my boss at the time, uh, at that time, people started asking questions. So maybe we are mistaken. Maybe it's not the right guy. And that started the process of divorce between Putin and the rest of the society. But still, the majority of, of the population, they said, OK, so maybe, yeah, maybe the president is pretty much authoritarian. Maybe uh, he doesn't like some of liberties which we acquired during the 90s. But what are those liberties for? Those liberties meant chaos for the country. They meant poverty for Russian people. They uh, meant corruption. And why do we need this freedom of speech? Why do we need this freedom of assembly? Why do we need those competitive elections? Maybe we trade them for stability and for better living. And uh, you know, my genuine belief that among all human rights, the most important one is indeed for a decent living. And that's what Putin was offering for the society. And that's what was delivered. 
I might debate a lot that it was not actually Putin who delivered this to Russian people, that it was rather high oil prices. But uh, it doesn't matter. Winner takes it all, and he was the obvious winner in this situation. And that's why people were ready to vote for whatever Putin was asking for and support his party and support him personally and keep him in power. And even when he was coming back in 2012, yes, by that time, middle class uh, protested. And I was part of those protests. And we said, like, it's totally unfair. And that's like stripping the country from any hope for any changes in the development in future. But still, the majority of the country believe that stability is more important. And that's what is Putin. Putin is nobody. Putin is the person of stability. Putin is the status quo. And his main virtue for the country is that he is the status quo, that he has no distinct face, that he is no distinct ideology, that he is not calling us somewhere, that he is just saying, you know, stick with me and you'll be safe and the, and the country will prosper and you would all benefit. And even in the mass propaganda inside the country during all those years, Putin was never saying that he is good. Never. Instead, he was saying, I am bad. I am corrupt. And so corrupt are my people. But we're still better than those in the 90s. And people said, yes, you know, if the choice between those of the 90s and Putin, we better stick with Putin. Despite, yes, he is corrupt, and yes, he has no clear vision of future, and yes, there is no future new Russia with him, but at least we can live, we can survive, and that's better. No changes are better. And it was like this, but since he lost support of creative class in 2011, when they decided to switch over with President Medvedev, he started to feel that the power is slipping through his fingers. Because at the end of the day, it's the creative class, it's those who write articles, it's those who create new technologies, it's those who are entrepreneurs, they are the people who create future. And they denied that there is any future with Putin. Some of them were just leaving Russia. Some of them were implanting skepticism in whatever they say. And then there was this example of Ukraine where the same middle class rebelled, rebelled against the very similar regime as the one that was proposed by Mr. Putin, the regime of corruption, the regime of a very close circle of President Yanukovych cronies. And they made their statement that uh, people can be victorious. And they can make those corrupt presidents, which seemingly collected all the power in their hands, to run away. What can be worse as a message? Of course not. And Putin feared, the, feared that message. And he decided to retaliate. And that's how the decision to take over Crimea was made. To my mind, there are now, now a lot of people who are very apologetic about Putin here in the US. There are people at the very left of the political spectrum who say, you know what? He is at the end of the day is fighting against imperialism. Some of them even say he's fighting against American imperialism. That's why we need to support him, because he is an alternative. I never understood being a leftist myself. What's the difference between American imperialism and Russian imperialism or any other imperialism? <laughs> but they somehow feel that there is some difference. And uh, some of the people whom I admired for many years, like famous director Oliver Stone is right now, making a movie about uh, decent President Yunukovych and how he was replaced by international treason 
by international conspiracy coordinated by United States. Okay, so they have their position, but that's what they believe in. Or some people from the ultra right who are saying, you know, we here in America have very weak presidents, it's a shame of the country. That's the real man. Look how he is bare-chested chasing some bears in Siberian taiga. <laughs> That's what we should see in America. That's what the global leader is. I don't believe that's the global leader. I believe that the global leader is exactly the one which makes global peace and make as many people prosper as it is possible and as less interfering with global politics as it is possible. That's the vision of global leader for myself, but that's not universal vision of everyone. And Putin actually started to feel those ideas. One of uh, my uh, relatives, actually uncle-in-law, he was coordinating Communist International as a member of Politburo of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And uh, I was myself saying all the time inside Russia, let's indeed try to make the dialogue of all the progressive forces across the world in this, through the social forums, engage them to, at the end of the day, eliminate borders, uh, promote free travel, promote free exchanges, promote convergence of values, because at the end of the day, I feel like uh, there is no difference between Russia, Europe, or United States. Our values are exactly the same. We have the same roots of Christian civilization, and we stay on the very similar set of approaches to life. But no, instead, at that time, this idea was turned down, but it was revived uh, last year when they picked up relatively unimportant uh, propaganda outlet, which was called Russia Today at the time, which was... Uh, uh, a TV station which was just making pictures of Russia and documentaries and whatever, very nice, but uh, nobody watched it, and converted it in uh, a really powerful international tool, the true conservative international, which is working right now with this 5% of ultra left and 5% of ultra right, which makes altogether 10% of very devoted followers in the Western audiences. And that's how Putin exercises his global power, which is growing every day. And that's totally invisible for most of uh, outside observers. RT, that's how Russia Today is, is called right now, has more viewers than CNN, but nobody recognizes it. And when you start digging in on the particular issues of international policies, like who is behind a lot of uh, protests uh, like environmentalists, you would see that it's actually inspired very much by Russia today. You know, I, during one period of my time, lived uh, in Boston. And I still have a lot of uh, friends in that neighborhood. And I was meeting with uh, one of Congress people, Congressman McGovern, who was very helpful uh, in passing Magnitsky Act uh, against Russian corruption years, and he is representing one district next, next to Boston. And uh, he said, like, I'm facing a lot of protests inside my constituency, and they are complaining against the, the construction of a gas pipeline, which is just adjacent with another gas pipeline, which is already there, and I don't understand why they're doing this, because it's obvious that like, gas is more clean than oil, and the, anyway, there is no ecological hazard for the community, vice versa, it's rather income for, for, the, for the community, but they still protest. And I started investigating where the information is coming from. And people who were living there, they brought me some leaflets, and it was obvious that it's coming from Russia today. And in this situation, when uh, I'm talking to guys in the White House, I'm, I'm telling them, I understand, of course, that like ISIS is a, like a usual enemy. 
Middle East is something which is a usual focus for many, many American administrations in a row, for energy issues, for many other issues, although it's uh, lesser important right now because America is really gaining its uh, energy independence uh, pretty soon, but still it's a, it's, it's, it's a focus of interest. But what is, more dan most is more dangerous for the global security? Is it ISIS or is it Russia today? And my answer is that it is Russia today. But because how much traction ISIS gets among the Western constituency, yes, it is the source of immediate danger of terrorist attacks, of physical violence, but it cannot challenge Western values. RT can, and it does. And it's doing this uh, very silently. It disrupts the very core of our society. And it creates a real split between Russia Europe and America, and that's its main objective. And to conclude my initial statements, I, uh, my sta initial statement, I think that this is exactly the reason why we should discuss future of Russia and more broader Eastern Europe, because it's no longer a local issue. There is bloodshed in Eastern Europe. There is bloodshed in Ukraine, and we Russians are at fault, and I'm sure there will be some questions I would be answering why it's happening, but it's no longer between us and Ukrainians. It's now about the future of our civilization. And I would like to remind you that in the 30s, nobody believed in Holocaust. And President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, when they were hearing reports of the intelligence from Germany, they said, no, it cannot be happening. It's 20th century, for God's sake. It's not true. But it happened to be true. But when people realized that, it was too late. So let's make it that it's not too late. Thank you. wired here, you know, as if I'm not tapped by my phone. <laughs> Our thanks to Ilya Panamarov, uh, opposition member of the Russian State Duma. Thank you very much for a very interesting brief uh, opening remarks. Uh, we have a lot of questions from the audience, and so I will get us started. I have to confess, I ha have no background in Russia. And I, I, I grew up in Iran, so I, I'm a neighbor. I know a little bit about the culture and history, but I don't have any expertise. So I'm going to rely on the audience to ask very good questions. You are the liberated woman of Islamic Republic of Iran. <laughs> <laughs> so you should know everything I'm about Persian. our part of the world. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so here, here we go. The first question I'd like to uh, ask you is, uh, Obviously, the issue of Crimea is something, annexation of Crimea is something that is close to your heart. You voted against the annexation. Um, and so in the media in the US, the conversation is such that it makes it sound that joining of Ukraine as part of NATO is highly justified. What was your thinking when you were an opposition voter? And did you, do you think that joining of Ukraine as a member of NATO is justified for their safety? I think that the uh, thing which is justified is joining Russia into NATO and burying it all together. Uh, because I think, of course, that the uh, philosophy of uh, these military blocks uh, is outdated. That's a philosophy of the 20th century. But that's exactly the philosophy of Putin. He's talking about spheres of influence, the division of power, you know, and when somebody continues 
this kind of discussion, I, I think that he is actually playing into his favor and in favor of the current Russian regime. But the story is that Ukrainians, before we uh, invaded into Crimea, um, they were almost unanimous against uh, joining NATO. Uh, the polls indicated that it was like 15% against 85% uh, pro and against joining NATO. There was a tiny part of Ukrainian elites who were in favor, but nobody actually wanted. Um, why Ukrainians uh, uh, voted uh, for associations, not even like joining European Union, but some association with European Union, because they wanted to stop violence within the country. They wanted rule of law within the country, and they felt like Europeans would bring this, this kind of tradition, would restrain their elites, and would allow free travel. That was the rationale. There was nothing about like military alliances or whatsoever. And vice versa, it was clear that when we invaded, that we would shift uh, uh, the, 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 this kind of understanding on behalf of Ukrainians. And we did. Right now, it's 55% pro-NATO and 45 against. It's still very much split, as you see. So it's still there is no, like, everybody inside Ukraine wants to join NATO, but taking very hard push on behalf of Ukrainian leadership and the situation of uh, growing aggression and growing uh, invasion of Russian military forces, of course, you know, that that, that might happen any, any time. And of course, I think that's against our interests, but it's against global interest because it's the old concept. I want to stay on this question because there are quite a few questions about this and so I'm sort of combining several of them. So was it for the Ukrainian people, was it more a Eurozone issue so they can do trade under the EU rules or was it more a defense issue to be part of NATO first? And secondly, is is President Putin justified to think that if Ukraine becomes a member of NATO, is an existential threat to Russia? So these are two questions that I think are very tied to what you were saying. Accession to NATO was never in the agenda of the revolution. And there was not a part of the demands of the people on the streets in Ukraine. And I think that actually uh, the person who is bringing this issue to the spotlight is Mr. Putin, because he wants to justify the annexation of Crimea, which is totally ridiculous because Crimea was a territory where Russian military base was. Nobody was debating this. It was a long-term treaty, which is protecting the status of this military base in Sebastopol. And actually, this military base was used in the process of annexation because, you know, you, you, you uh, Russia didn't need to move any additional forces in the region because they were already there. So it, it's, it's rather Ukrainians who, who, who could complain than, than us. And uh, uh, of course, right now, uh, Putin's strategy is try to win support among part of Western elites. And that's where I see from many like former Department of State people, you know, they are saying, okay, because they are also living in this Cold, cold War uh, era thinking. And they are saying, you know, what about this expansion of, of NATO? For Ukrainians, it was an existential issue. It was an issue of understanding that we are part of Europe. And that's why I think that it, it was Europeans who made a grave mistake from the very beginning when they started the process of uh, Euro integration. Putin, in his mind, is a very um, rational and very uh, monetaristic uh, type, type person. He calculated that for Ukrainian economy, uh, it's not profitable to become part of European economical space rather than being a part of customs union. And I think he was exactly right. For Ukraine, it was more profitable way more profitable to be part of customs union. But customs union in the mind of a common Ukrainian was associated with Putin's corruption, with uh, no uh, legal protection, with oligarchs, with cronies, 
with a permanent redistribution of property with everything that comes with it. So they were choosing Europe as a cultural choice, as a civilizational choice. And if Europe would want this process to happen peacefully, of course they should have offered European association from the very beginning, both to Ukraine and Russia. Russia could have turned this down, but at least it would not felt alienated because of course part of our elites felt like, you know, we are being pushed aside and it's like a separate deal. And uh, just a little bit of uh, details uh, uh, about the thing because I felt like I was probably the only uh, representative of Russian government who was during 2013 touring European Union and campaigning against European Association of Ukraine because I, I, it was clear for me you know, that the way they have chosen would inevitably lead to this kind of conflict between Europe and Russia and of course I didn't want this conflict. And uh, the story was that uh, Germany, who was the, and is the leader of uh, uh, the European Union, they were at that time consumed within their internal elections in 2013. They have an uh, internal uh, struggle between social democrats and, and Christian democrats and just liberals who were at the time uh, chairing the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Germany. So uh, Germany said, okay, so it's not our question, it's the question of European Commission. European Commission has formed the task force group for this uh, 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 European integration, which was chaired by a uh, Europe uh, uh, Commissar named Füle, who was a graduate of Moscow Institute of Foreign Relations. Uh, and he is from Czechoslovakia, and he lived through uh, invasion in 1968, and he has all these memories about this. Plus, there was a chairmanship in the European Union by Lithuania, small country, with also a lot of tensions with Russia, and they wanted to be commemorated by some huge success during their chairmanship. And they were supporting this association. To their, uh, 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 to be fair, I would say that when we met with leaders of Lithuania, and I explained you know, what would be the consequence for the Lithuania, by the way, and when I see the mountain tensions for the Lithuania, Lithuanians, they, they pushed back a, li a little bit. But uh, European Commission was still pushing forward because that was the justification for those bureaucrats to exist. And that's the result that we have. And right now, uh, Councillor Merkel is saying, you know, what have we done? Uh, French are saying, what have we done? Americans are saying, what have we done? You know, Americans are actually complaining uh, that it's like it's Europeans' fault. Um, our diplomatic service didn't pay enough attention because at that time it was a big international scandal with Pussy Riot and all our uh, embassies, they were totally uh, under DDoS attack by uh, international public opinion about these poor girls who were imprisoned in Russia and you know everybody was, was uh, asking for them to be released and that was the only thing that they were doing. So for such minor issues as uh, uh, European integration of Ukraine, they just didn't pay enough attention. And that's what we see. Um, you're from, you represent Siberia, which is a very resource-rich part of Russia. So let's talk a little bit about resources and the Russian economy. And by the way, it's a nice place. It's like California. <laughs> 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 no, really. <laughs> Okay, so, so the, the oil prices have crashed. We'll get you back, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> they are one-third, roughly, the price of oil is roughly one-third of what it was in 2007 when you were just a young freshman elected from Siberia. And of course, Russian economy depends heavily on resources, especially oil and gas. So if the price of oil stays at this price level, plus minus 10%, 15%, bobbing up and down, how do you think in the long run, maybe more than two or three years, how would this impact Russian economy and the political landscape? In? Because we all know the political landscape 
derives from the economic landscape. So talk about that to us, please. Um, thank you very much for this question. I think that the West is very much living in its myths about Russian economy and about, you know, how uh, Russia uh, is taking that or another global uh, processes. The truth is that, firstly, uh, direct uh, impact of oil and gas sales on Russian state budget is between 25 and 30 percent of revenues, which is significant, is the uh, first largest source of revenue, but it's not even 50 percent. We are not like Venezuela, which is like 80 percent dependent on the oil prices, and the economy of Saudi Arabia is way less healthy in, in this regard as Russian economy is. Of course, there are a lot of derivatives that are coming from oil because the financial system uh, capitalized with uh, oil money and uh, oil money are, uh, is, is supporting uh, positive cash balance within the, within the country, etc., etc., etc. Plus, uh, 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 Russian economy is not exactly the most energy efficient one and all the energy prices like electricity, etc., is also direct derivatives uh, uh, from the oil. So even like for our agriculture to be competitive, it, it's dependent on the oil. Uh, but uh, what happened when the oil prices went down, uh, our government just devalued ruble. Um, the prices went down virtually twice as they were before, and the ruble devalued twice as it was before. So in terms of ruble nominated budget, nothing has changed. As there were social obligations, and the pensions and the subsidies and the welfares, they still are the same. It increased the welfare nature of uh, Russian state where virtually half of economically active population is dependent on a different government activity. So it made our economy lesser healthy than it was before. It made it more government dependent, but there is no catastrophic events. Uh, what is really bad is because of the devaluation of ruble, uh, all the imports became way more expensive. And that means that already prices for general groceries in Russian stores, they are, they are up like 25, 30, 35%, which is very significant, uh, but then Thank you very much, Mr. America. Because uh, Putin is now saying it's not because we're stupid. It's not because government doesn't know what to do. It's because of this bloody Obama. He imposed those sanctions. We are at war. And that's a holy war for us because we are protecting our brother Ukrainians. It's here you think that we are invading Ukraine. But in Russia, we don't think that we are invading Ukraine. We are protecting Ukrainians from you. Uh, you have installed a fascist marionette regime, junta, as it's called in Russia, and we are trying to kick them out, protecting our brothers, we are fighting against fascists, and for this we have to suffer a little bit, and people even appreciate it. Because that's, uh, you know, that makes us stronger, and uh, uh, Russian national identity uh, is very much linked to the victory in World War II. That's the main holiday in Russia, the, the Victory Day, we, which we celebrate on the 9th of May and not on the 8th of May as, uh, as, as, the rest, as the rest of the world. And that's really like the main holiday. And everybody wants to be like our grandparents were when they defeated fascism. We, in the way, you know why I'm saying that Siberia is very much like uh, California, I'm like, I'm not joking. Uh, because I think that uh, Russia, as Russians, as, as people, they are way closer to Americans than, for example, to Europeans and their mentality. Because we totally distrust the state. Uh, we are very individualistic. 
uh, we are very entrepreneurial, just our entrepreneurial spirit goes in how to cheat the state, but that's because <laughs> of uh, very short living um, uh, environment, you know, it's, it's not necessarily would always be uh, uh, the case. And Siberia is like Wild West, is, uh, is, the, is the area that, that we are not exactly conquered, but we assimilated it and, and brought to the rest of, of the country as, as pioneers. And uh, uh, that makes us very much the same. And the Russians, uh, as, as the nation, we also have mission in life. If Europeans, their mission is uh, to have lifetime employment, you know, have nice salary, you know, uh, and start working at 10 a.m. and finish at 6 p.m., you know, and drink beer and enjoy themselves. You know, you want to carry this torch of freedom and democracy to other nations, even when they are against. And we are the same. We also want to liberate other countries, and we think that's our mission in life. And that's exactly what Putin is, is capitalizing on. Uh, a reminder for our radio audiences. You're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program, and our guest today is Ilya Ponomarev, opposition member of the Russian state Duma. Okay, on with the rest of the questions. Again, related to the gas and oil. No Just tough questions, Jelly? Huh? No tough questions? Wait, 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 I have tough <laughs> questions for you. Just wait. Um, this is regarding uh, the proposed gas pipeline through Turkey. Uh, do you think is, uh, this is something that is definitely going to be done, or what's the status? What do you think about that? I think it's a bluff. Uh, according to my information, uh, and I talked to several very senior people in, in Turkey recently, they were caught by surprise when Mr. Putin on the press conference actually announced that there is there going to be a pipeline going through Turkey. <laughs> is, you know, they even couldn't complain at the moment because they didn't know what to say. Uh, and uh, if we look at the situation rationally, you would see that it's very unlikely that this project would ever happen because uh, there is now a major uh, gas discovery uh, uh, in the Mediterranean on the offshore of Israel. There is a new pipeline that is being built through Cyprus to, Greek, to Greece and through Greece to European Union, which would supply more gas than Gazprom was supposed to supply through uh, South Stream. And those supplies are reliable because they are from offshore fields. That's why whatever instability would happen even in Israel, those supplies would never be disrupted. And as you understand, uh, for Turkey, relations with Greece, they're not exactly like the best uh, they might have. And the pipeline that goes through Cyprus also affects a lot the problem of northern Cyprus, which also they are the, uh, the main player. So in this situation, Greece would never allow to build another pipeline through, uh, pipeline through Turkish territory, through Greece, and let Turkey grab all the benefits from transiting this, this gas when they can have the, the benefits for themselves. So what's happening in reality, and thanks for my wife, who actually documented this recently, Gazprom is continuing constructing the pipeline in the Black Sea because they say it was already paid, so why not put the rest of the pipelines? They already delivered, you know, they are stored, you know, so why, why not put them in, in, in place? You know, money is already paid. And uh, it's been done, been done, by the way, by European contractors, you know, who do not care about whatever sanctions are being imposed because, of, again, of the double standards of the Western societies. And I think that the plan is very simple, that, you know, the construction of the pipeline would take another two years, three years from now. It would be finished. As I said, it's paid already anyway, so there is no additional costs. It would be already there in the sea. And then, you know, the sanctions would be lifted for whatever reason, and then the pipeline would be operational. And I think that's the plan. And all the discussions with Turkey and whatever is just a decoy. Um, a question uh, which is sort of a recent event of the shooting and murder of uh, Boris Nemtsov. 
when you read the U U.S. media, you get all these kind of speculation, including a number of conspiracy theories. What is your own, including like CIA has done it, things like that. What is your own assessment of who might have killed him? Uh, firstly, I want to say that uh, Boris himself was a very decent figure. And uh, he was a great guy personally, not such a popular politician inside Russia. So there was zero threat in terms of like electoral support that he might have. Uh, he was named once as uh, the successor to Yeltsin by Yeltsin himself. But uh, by that time it was uh, um, a mistake made. Uh, uh, Yeltsin, when he was naming him as a successor, he appointed him as a first vice prime minister supervising the economy in the situation when the economy was not exactly in the best shape. And Boris, with all his passion, assumed all the responsibility with the very unpopular reforms. And he originally was a very popular regional governor of Nizhny Novgorod, and then he turned to be an extremely unpopular government bureaucrat. Uh, and that sh shadow of uh, 90s stayed with Nemtsov during his whole life. So I think that one of the reasons why he was chosen as a victim for this horrible crime is exactly because those who were choosing him, they, they didn't think that the country would revolt after this. Because, yeah, Moscow liked him. The rest of the country like really didn't pay uh, too much of the attention. So I think that the meaning of this murder is the message to the elites. It's a very strong message to Russian elites because everybody knew him because he was the first vice prime minister of the economy. So all the business people, they knew him and, and now they see like jokes aside, it's not already about the property, it's about their physical survival uh, in the country. It's a very powerful uh, uh, message. And secondly, of course, that's the message to the West. What, what is the message? Um, I think it would be clear within like two, three weeks from now whom Kremlin would decide to blame uh, uh, for this crime. Uh, for me, it's 100% obvious that it has to be a participation of security forces in this. It happened uh, on the bridge that connects uh, St. Basil's Cathedral with uh, like the most close historical uh, uh, place next to Kremlin. And uh, it's jammed with cameras. Uh, whatever happening there, when somebody protests, it usually takes one or two minutes for the police to arrive. Because it's, it's, it's all visible. Uh, in this particular situation, for some reason, no police, no security forces. And for murderers, it's clear if they have chosen that place, they would, they would fail something for their personal security. Because, you know, if they would let Boris to walk just another uh, less than a mile to the place where he lived, there are a lot of small passages, you know, dark corners, uh, uh, where his body would not be recovered, you know, another day or two. So it was clear a public demonstration. And it was done by a person who felt totally invulnerable in all senses. Additionally, they even left the witness, the lady which was accompanying uh, Nemtsov, which would never happen, you know, in the situ situation of, a, of any murder. So it was, it was absolutely clear that it's, it's security people. We have uh, uh, a precedent in, in, in Russian history. It happened in 1934. Uh, it was assassination of Sergei Kirov, one of Stalin's allies. Uh, it happened by accident, you know. He was assass assassinated uh, uh, for uh, uh, absolutely non-political uh, reason. But Stalin used this to start the great purges and the great terror of 1937. 
And all our people that worked in KGB, they know this as an example, how they can get influence. A year ago, with the invasion of Ukraine, a major proce pro uh, process of uh, redistributing the power within the country has started. And it firstly was happening within the economy, but it was clear that it's, it's, it, it, it should transform to, to politics uh, as well. And I think that's the sign that this process has started. So I think it's one of clans which is very close to, to Putin. It's obviously security guys. We have several security clans, so I, I cannot say it's one or another. But it's one of those security clans. And by those whom they would blame, it would be clear uh, whom it would be. And I think that there are only two possible options whom they would blame. They would blame either Ukrainians and uh, actually the reason again why Boris Nemtsov, because the message is for the West that you are supporting those guys in Ukraine and you see what, what's, what, what they are doing, you know, they can do some dirty jobs uh, uh, in Russia to provoke you to, to, to supply lethal, uh, lethal weapons uh, uh, to Ukraine. And the alternative might be a person like Mikhail Khodorkovsky to be able to arrest all his people inside the country and say that they were plotting some treason um, and conspiracy against the state. Um, next question has to do with the culture of the politics and leadership in, in Russia. Russia has a long history of dominant leaders from czars to Soviet Union leaders. Uh, it seems like the culture uh, is comfortable with a single figurehead who is quite um, strong. What would, you, what would you think would change the mindset in, uh, in, within Russia and change the culture to want to have a more democratic, open society? I actually very strongly disagree uh, with this also stereotype uh, perception of Russian political culture. Uh, firstly, a very fresh example of President Medvedev who proved that Russia can live without a president and it's okay. Uh, and uh, um, that it's uh, actually it was a kind of parliamentary democracy at the, at the moment because the true leader was Putin at the time and he was like the prime minister who was representing United Russia, the ruling party, and the president couldn't do much against him. Uh, but even before that, the uh, Soviet uh, tradition of course, we had uh, very autocratic leaders like Joseph Stalin, who was obviously very autocratic. But from the other side, right after Stalin, we had Khrushchev, who was absolutely dependent on the Politburo, and it was a collective leadership and not unanimous, centralized leadership. And uh, other Soviet leaders, they were also, some were more authoritarian, some were more collective type leadership. And generally the Soviet system was a collective, system of collective leadership and not uh, a single person leadership. Also, it was just because uh, the culture dictated uh, that it would be just a public face. Um, that's why it was seen as like it's a one strong leader. But I wouldn't say that even like Brezhnev could make decisions on his own. He had to consult a lot, you know, with Ustinov, with Gramyka, uh, with Suslov, with uh, other functions, with Kasigin, uh, with other uh, prominent figures uh, of, of that time. Or Gorbachev, he was a very weak leader. He always had to balance uh, uh, within his own ranks. So I strongly disagree. It's a question of system. And uh, I think that this system can be built in Russia. The problem is that always when we are starting building the system, that political pragmatism, the short living interest, they always prevail. And when uh, Yeltsin was promoting his constitution in 1993, we were saying from the very beginning, even there was even heard this precise scenario that you are implanting the possibility of some KGB colonel to take over the power right after you would leave. I can show you such article by one of very well-known Russian politologists in 90, back in 1993. 
And actually, by the way, if not American support at the time for this new constitution, it would never be passed. So we have to thank you as well, and all us. Yeah. Um, so you have been barred uh, from going back to Russia. What, what was the official reason that President Putin and the government uh, put forward as to why you shouldn't, despite the fact that you were elected member of the Congress or Parliament, you were not allowed to go. The official line, the party line. Actually, it was a very sad story. It was, uh, uh, they um, tried to open a criminal case against me uh, on the ground of the Skolkova Foundation that you mentioned. Uh, there was uh, a contract which I was supervising uh, whose objective was to bring MIT to Russia. And it was successful. MIT was in Russia and we created this new university, and uh, uh, so we totally delivered on what was promised. Uh, and uh, since I was an MP, there was a way how to appropriate the money, which was at the time approved by uh, Medvedev and, and his people and checked with the audit chamber and whatever, but then um, uh, people from the investigators committee sold Putin an idea that those money uh, were actually not for Skolkova, but to, to finance the protest, that it was Medvedev who was pissed off with uh, the necessity to go away, to step down, and that he funneled the money through me to, to finance uh, the protests uh, on, on, on the streets. And uh, that's how this whole middle class, you know, white ribbon revolution in 2011 has started. It turned out not to be the case. The investigators, even with this totally controlled environment, couldn't open the criminal case against me. But it was enough that for during half a year, they were doing a lot of PR attacks on myself, uh, and uh, they were dividing the uh, um, uh, amount of funding that was in the contract to the uh, uh, number of public appearances, which they called lectures, and they called me the most expensive lecturer in the world history. Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then Skolkova Foundation, which is totally a government-controlled body, said that there was a provision in the contract that I was supposed to care about the reputation of Skolkova, and I ruined the reputation of Skolkova. And on that ground, they uh, pressed uh, civil charges against me, uh, which was, uh, like, very fair uh, uh, to open to try to open a criminal case and then to charge me with their inability to open that case against me. But it was enough uh, that uh, the court made a preemptive uh, ruling uh, to uh, block me from crossing the border. That is a measure that, is, uh, 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 that exists in Russian uh, legislation to prevent debtors to run away from their creditors but they made it in the, in the time when I was outside Russia and not inside Russia, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> so, um, as a member of the opposition, I assume, we don't know, I'm asking, are you in contact with other members of the opposition leader? Is the opposition... Uh, block, making any headways, progress. Uh, tell us a little bit about the new alliance of the Green Party and the Social Democrats you form. Just talk a little bit about this area of your life, the being a, a very prominent opposition member. Uh, right now, the opposition, as it should be, is not existent in Russia. Uh, Russian people right now are pretty deep to any opposition messages. And it is so during the last year uh, since the invasion in Ukraine has started. Uh, we are very much repeating uh, the history of 1914, uh, when it was World War I, and we also were protecting our brother Slavs, Serbs at that time against foreign invasion. At the beginning, like everyone, including the opposition to Tsar, got united on these patriotic grounds 
that you know for greater Russia we need to protect it and you know we we need to fight Germans and uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. that's exactly the spirit uh, that exists in Russia right now at that time it was a tiny sect of Bolsheviks the only political force which dared to say against and it was really a tiny sect it was literally several thousand people most of them were either in prisons or in asylum Lenin was outside Russia, and they were only people who were saying against. And we are right now more or less in the same situation. So the Rados, opposition-minded people, they are mostly concentrated in the capitals and in the larger cities. They are very fragmented. They have all the different opinions and all the, the, the dif different agendas, political agendas. We are right now in this resistance mode. We think that time will pass, it would not be a very long time. Actually, I think it would be very symbolic because the actual uprising might start in 2017 for many different reasons because we will have major parliamentary elections in 2016 and also our economic financial reserves um, might get depleted by that time because of the sanctions and the uh, uh, issues with financial uh, liquidity, etc., etc. So all the, the problems would mount uh, and would uh, be at their height in, in, in 2017. So I think that at the time we need to be ready and we need to present Russia with a clear program, with a clear vision of Russia after Putin, because this is something that we as the opposition really lack. And I think that's the job which needs to be done by Russian diaspora. Actually, I recently learned a thing which makes me like very surprised that Russians are the second largest foreign, uh, foreign born uh, constituency group here in the United States after Mexicans. Uh, uh, that's official uh, figure of uh, US census. Um, it's altogether around six million of uh, Russian speaking people in North America. Uh, uh, 5.5 million in US alone that not only Russian but it's also uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, and Belarus but it's all people who care about what's going on in Russia and right now most of those people they are pretty angry especially those entrepreneurs who were coming very recently and who are right now living here in Silicon Valley and that's what we are trying to do. We have established uh, uh, a foundation. My friends have done this. Uh, my wife is participating in it uh, as well, which is called Free Russia Foundation, and which is targeted to unite diaspora and to develop this vision and to relay it back to Russia. And uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky is working very hard that in 2016, when there would be uh, uh, Duma elections, parliamentary elections, that in every single district, electoral district, there would be a unified candidate of the opposition. So then we can match the vision and the people and present it to the society. We don't think that we can win through the elections because the elections are totally rigged, but we can propagate the vision. And then in 2017, you would see really new Russia. Interesting statistics. I, I wasn't aware of that, but I think the size of the audience perhaps has something to do with this little bit of a statistics tonight. We have a very good attendance. Um, I'm sure you read the and listen to the mainstream media here in the U.S. From your perspective, a Russian first, so Russian citizen, and secondly, a Russian politician, do you think American journalists are doing a good job of educating and informing Americans in terms of the reality of what is happening out there and, and what it is that we as American citizens can do to, to promote the cause of democracy in Russia? You know, the beauty of America to me is that there is no one mainstream. Yeah. <laughs> And that's the difference from Russia. Uh, the weakness is that uh, um, United States traditionally is so self-consumed in its own internal problems. 
and I think that the current foreign policies of this administration are totally derived from the internal matters rather than from any kind of rational objective thinking. So even when they are driven by best intentions, they are not thought to the details which are sometimes extremely important. And the uh, best example for this is this issue of lethal weapons supply to Ukraine, because if that would be American weapons to be supplied to Ukraine, then firstly, there is nobody in the Ukrainian army who is trained to use them. Uh, secondly, that's another cause for Russian propaganda to say that we are fighting with America there. If the same amount of funding would be made available not to US military complex, but to Eastern European countries, which are sitting on the vast stockpiles which are left from Warsaw Pact and which are totally unutilized since those countries became part of NATO, then you would reinforce Slavic Union against this vision of Russian world that Putin is promoting. And that would really help Ukrainians because this is exactly the weapons they are trained with, familiar with, and that they, they can really use to protect life of innocent people in the country. And you see the same objective and the same issue of, uh, of these weapons can be done uh, differently. Unfortunately, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the whole system of analytics was totally destroyed of Sovietologists. And right now there are some very bright minds who are saying the right words, but unfortunately the most coherent message about Russia is being delivered by Russia today. Um, it's been a wonderful conversation. Unfortunately, we've got to a point in time that we have only one last question. And, and I'd like to take the prerogative of the moderator to ask my own question. Uh, that has to do with Middle East, obviously. Uh, from, from the history that I have read and all the things that I, I get a sense of what's going on in geopolitics, it seems to me for a long time, Russia or Soviet Union, whatever it has been, has always been interested in access to warm waters in the Persian Gulf. So, and we see presence of Russia now in, in the Middle East in doing different parts. Could you tell us quickly, perhaps, I know it's a long answer, but in a nutshell, what is President Putin's strategy in the Middle East? What's the end game for him? Firstly, I'd like to say that I think it was rather British than Russians who wanted always the access to different treasures. <laughs> Uh, of Middle East, and that's why we see such a mess there. Uh, um, secondly, uh, I think that there is no real strategy, uh, uh, unfortunately, in Russia during the last 25 years uh, for the Arab world, for just generally uh, Middle uh, uh, East at all. Uh, and we act extremely opportunistic. We think that it's just a playground to make trade-offs with America. Uh, for which it is the, the area of the uh, core interest. And my personal opinion, you know, I don't want to diminish the effect that Middle East have on the global security and the economy and, and everything, but I think that especially as the United States is gaining its energy independence, we should be way more focused on working w with each other. And I think that uh, we really should focus on creating this greater northern union of nations which would include Russia, um, Europe, and United States. We in Russia had a very long-standing concept of being a third Rome, and I think if we had assumed that the first Rome is naturally where the Rome is, and the second Rome is in the United States, and we are the third Rome, then we would create a really stable and long-lasting alliance which we would all enjoy living in. Um, on behalf of the Commonwealth Club, <laughs> I want to thank you, Ilya Ponomarev, uh, for the conversation. Ilya is opposition member of the Russian State Duma. 
We, I want to also thank the audience for great questions that you sent up here, and I'm sorry we didn't go through all of them. I'm Jale Dai, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know, is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.